Welcome to the Cyber Insider, MCSoft's podcast all about cybersecurity. Your hosts today are Brett Callow, Threat Analyst here at MCSoft, and I'm Luke Connolly, Partner Manager. And we're very excited to have Meredith Grafanti with us today. Meredith is the head, the global head of cybersecurity and data privacy communications at DC-based FTI Consulting, a role she was only recently promoted into. So congratulations on that, Meredith. Thank she you. Start- She started her career on Capitol Hill and then joined Equifax, where she had the pleasure of handling the response to one of the biggest data breaches of all time. She's based in New York, New York, and is in the process of becoming a certified information system security professional. And last year, traveled with her entire family to watch the World Cup in Qatar, where she was cheering for Uruguay. Welcome, Meredith, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Well, thank you very much for having me, Luke and Brett. I'm glad to be here. And maybe to start off and to satiate the curiosity of our listeners who aren't from Uruguay, you could (laughs) start by refreshing our memories as to how they fared in the World Cup. Uh, Well, unfortunately, they did not make it out of the first round, but I actually had the pleasure of living in Uruguay when I worked for Equifax. I was um, the head of communications for our Latin America region for the company, and I lived in Montevideo, which is the capital of Uruguay. Um, went to see a few uh, games when La Celeste, as they're so lovingly called, played. And, you know, it's part of the culture in South America to be a big football fan. And I sort of adapted that and um, made sure my entire family had the chance to watch them play in Qatar. So that was a really cool experience. Every four years, my entire family goes to the World Cup. It's kind of a a thing we've always done. So it was great to do that with them and to be there this past year. That's fantastic. I've heard Montevideo is beautiful. So uh, very envious of you for being able to live there. Um, Really quickly quickly to start off, uh, I mentioned that you were just promoted, but what is it that you do at FTI Consulting? Sure. So I lead the global cybersecurity and data privacy communications team at FTI. We are a, for lack of a better way to put it, a PR team that is specialized in crisis communications around incident response. So we sort of parachute in when a company goes through a ransomware attack, you know, insider threat, business email compromise, you name it. And we help the company figure out what to say to their most important stakeholders, be it customers, their employees, media, regulators, business partners. Um, so we really come in to, to help them figure out how to be as transparent as they can be around what happened while not getting ahead of the forensic investigation or saying or doing anything that they'll have to walk back later. Just out of curiosity, how long had you been with Equifax before the breach? Six. I was at Equifax for a total of six years. I think it had been a little over four years before the breach happened. So I was sort of the veteran on the PR team. I was still in my Latin America position when the breach happened and, and got called home to headquarters to help triage the response to the incident. Um, and, and, you know, that was a crisis that lasted for about a, a, a year, really, um, when you kind of think about them first disclosing the incident, um, their CEO resigning, insider trading allegations, 50 state, 50 state class action lawsuit, and then ultimately the indictment of PRC nationals. That, that entire process lasted about a year so that I was quite busy with the, the incident itself. And then I really fell in love with cyber working for the company's post-breach CISO, who's been a longtime mentor of mine and really taught me everything I know about cyber. My role with him was to, you know, help the company to communicate around what they were doing differently, how they were rebuilding the cybersecurity program and maturing it, um, and rebuilding trust with, with customers all around the world. So I'll never forget the days of sitting in his office and him drawing out on a whiteboard for me, like how a firewall worked and why it was important for the board to understand the investments that the company was making and upskilling talent, bringing new people on board, 
Um, he's a really fantastic leader. Is, is a guy by the name of Jamil Farshi uh, and someone I'm still quite close with to this day. Just wondering, and I'm not sure if you're able to answer this, but uh, did they have an, a response plan in advance? They did. Equifax was always a company that took cybersecurity seriously, I would say. They, you know, had incident response plans. They tabletopped uh, regularly like many companies do. But I think, you know, what we saw in that incident was, number one, sort of a, um, you know, an expectation that it would eventually blow over, that folks just didn't care that much about a data breach at a company that, you know, wasn't a household name for the most part. And, you know, when we tabletopped and we thought about cyber situations, I don't think they were quite envisioning a scenario where literally half the, the United States was impacted and affected by this attack, nor did we envision, you know, some of the, the things you just can't plan for in a worst case scenario happening, meaning, you know, this was during, I think it was Hurricane Irma, it hit one of our call centers that was surge, the surge capacity for us during the incident. Um, our customer service team mistakenly tweeted out a phishing link. Uh, we tried to be a provider of her own credit monitoring services, which I think the company bit off a little more than they could chew on, the, on that front. Um, and then, of course, you know, the insider trading allegations, the CEO resigning, FTC, SEC, DOJ investigations, testifying nine times in front of Congress. I mean, these are things you just don't plan for in your typical, you know, tabletop exercises. So now when I'm helping companies to prepare, I always think of, to have them think about like, what would your worst enemy do to you if they were trying to take you out? And how do you prepare for that kind of scenario? And also like practice it more than once a year, refine your plans, get better, poke holes in things, muscle memory. Like these are these are things that you gotta wake up and think about every single day. Yeah. Sorry, go on, Brett. Knowing what you do now, is there anything you would have done differently? in that incident? You know, I think when we look back and and uh, as, you know, obviously I don't work for FX anymore, but they had a lot of lessons learned, more so from a crisis management standpoint. Um, I think actually before I left, I helped to write sort of a lessons learned post-breach type of white paper that we shared quite broadly. And there were things like, you know, have a decision maker who's the shot caller, right, throughout the incident. I think there are a lot of people, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, people, you know, in various roles that had to sign off on things. We didn't have approval processes down pat. Um, so when we were thinking about, like, responding to hundreds of media inquiries, there was no ultimate decision maker on, on things. And eventually we got there, but those types of roles, responsibilities, escalation protocols and processes, those are things you wanna have down in your playbooks now, right? Before an incident happens, you don't wanna be building that plane while, while flying it. So now when I'm helping companies to prepare and they're like, can you write us a bunch of templates for that we can just pull off the shelf and use in the event of an incident response scenario? I'm like, it's really not a great use of your time for me to write a bunch of fictitious media holding statements for you. Like, let's get really granular on how you're set up from a work stream process. Who's the decision maker on the legal work stream? Who's running, you know, who's running the forensic and investigation work stream? Who's on point for comms, customer comms, regulator comms, employee comms? And how are those different work streams sharing information back and forth so that they're all moving together, you know, and progressing at the same time. So those are the types of things we focus on now and a lot of the lessons learned that I apply to my day-to-day -day work when it comes to preparedness. It's interesting. It sounds like a perfect storm of things that were hitting uh, Equifax. And, you know, we, we, we spoke with uh, Kieran Martin, who was the founding CEO of the National Cybersecurity Center at GCHQ last month. And he's pretty big on don't catastrophize. But at the same time, when you're planning, you really have to imagine the worst possible scenario, you know, a, a combination, a confluence of disasters. Um, 
whatever they may be so that you can you know don't get stuck in in the moment and and unable to respond that's a great point i mean i, I was just telling you before we hit record you know my day has been turned upside down because out of the blue one of my clients was called to testify in front of congress about their breach unexpected out of left field certainly not something they had planned for but that's kind of the crazy world of cyber we live in. You never know what the other shoe to drop might be, you know, be it reaction from the threat actor and pressure tactics they might deploy or reaction from various regulators and stakeholders. Right, right. Uh, that actually, and, and this speaks to something, this question talks to something you mentioned earlier, which is crisis communication be, can be tricky because the press and stakeholders want to know what's happening as soon as possible, but what organizations say and what they don't say can come back to haunt them down the road if they get something wrong um, or, or whatever. So how, how can they navigate that? How can they navigate that with their communications plan? I think it's a combination of having the communications team plugged in and having a seat at the table in the broader context of an incident response team. Because so often, as I talked about before, you've got these siloed work streams where the forensic team is learning more as the minutes go by, the legal team is kind of overseeing and directing the investigation and is very involved in what you can say, what you can't say. And then sometimes that, that information just gets passed down to the comms team like in an ancillary way. And they're not really equipped to go out there and talk to the press or develop proactive communications for customers. And if they had more visibility into what was going on in terms of forensics and the legal strategy, they could really be more effective in terms of what they're recommending. Um, you know, a lot of times we see uh, clients that are hit by a ransomware attack. And Brett and I have talked about this a lot, go out there and say, oh, it's a cybersecurity incident or a network disruption. A couple of days go by and then it's a, you know, an attack. A few more days go by and ultimately they own up to it being a ransomware attack. Um, and then you get into the whole, like, do you say data was compromised? Do you say you don't know yet? How do you kind of you know, navigate this evolving, very fluid situation. And, you know, our recommendation is always to be as transparent as you possibly can be without putting yourself in that position where you say no evidence data has been compromised. And then, you know, you don't really have any evidence because logs were right wiped and you don't, you know, you really don't know what you're dealing with. So not getting ahead of the forensics in, in terms of that type of scenario is really critical. So I think, the more you can ingrain the crisis comms team in the overall process and an incident response team, the better off everyone is. There's always this question of protecting privilege and how involved can you have a PR team be. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, like you got to do what's best for your stakeholders, your customers, your employees, and, and how can you communicate with them if the comms team only has half the picture in terms of what's going on. What type of incidents are you typically involved with? Is it mostly ransomware or? I think these days it's a lot of, you know, double extortion, triple extortion type ransomware. Um, we're seeing an uptick in, you know, espionage, IP theft type of incidents, um, which we didn't work on as many of those last year always the occasional APT sprinkled in or, or nation state type of activity, which I, I frankly enjoy a lot. You know, there's not as much of a need on those, you know, when you think back to the Equifax nation state style attack, um, there's not as many of those that are going gangbusters public because they tend to stay, stay a little bit more quiet <laughs> in terms of press coverage and, you know, having to disclose because there's not that operational disruption that you get with the ransomware style attacks. Um, and then a ton of preparedness work, as I said before. Everyone's worried about, you know, what, what's gonna happen to them and how they get ready for these SEC, NYDFS types of proposals that are coming down the pike. So we are doing a good bit on preparedness. And then I would say the, the last thing that we're really focused on in light of those proposals is, an offering we have called Secure Your Seat, which is all about helping the CISO 
who's, you know, you guys know, like very technical, very KPI oriented. How do we help the CISO to paint a better picture of risk, risk tolerance, risk acceptance at the board level? Um, so that's been a lot of fun and a new thing that we're we're working on. Just uh, because I do, I like to fill in the acronyms. APT, you talked about nation states. APTs are advanced persistent threats. They're na nation states using their resources to go after either, either nation states or, or for corporations for money or for intellectual property or whatever. And CISOs, of course, are um, chief information security officers. So let's get into the nitty gritty. What, um, Meredith, what's your most interesting war story? You must have seen a lot of things. Um, with the customers that you've dealt with. I know that you can't probably mention names, but uh, what sorts of incidents uh, really stick out in your mind? So the one I can talk about my name, um, it's public because our team actually won an award for the crisis communications response in conjunction with the client's communications team as Colonial Pipeline. Um, certainly one that most people are familiar with. It was a dark side ransomware attack um, that it's the Colonial Pipeline uh, IT infrastructure. There was worry about the potential for that threat to migrate to OT, so the pipeline itself, operational technology. It did not, but out of an abundance of caution, the company shut down the pipeline while they were investigating. And that caused um, sort of a East Coast uh, nationwide, well, not nationwide, but an East Coast fuel shortage a rush at the pump in, in big cities. Um, it was the first time I think there was very visual footage of the real world impact of a ransomware attack. You saw people, you know, taking trash bags to and, and big trash cans to the, the gas stations and filling them up and kind of hoarding gasoline. And uh, the White House obviously got involved. There were emergency orders that were handed down by the White House. Um, and we have a lot of state governments get involved as well. So that was certainly one to remember. I mean, the CEO was invited to testify, invited to testify in front of Congress twice. We were involved in helping him to prepare for that. Um, we took a little bit of a different tactic when it came to actually talking about paying the ransom and the reasoning behind that. Um, so that was quite interesting. We got out ahead of the congressional hearings and actually did a sit down with the Wall Street Journal to talk about why we paid the ransom. We did a sit down with Bloomberg to talk about root cause. Um, my team was involved in helping to brief the White House press secretary every day, as well as a cohort of government agencies, including the DOE, TSA. So it was really a you know, sleep and shifts type of project for, for my team for a number of days on end. Um, I think the company did a tremendous job, I, I might be biased, but of really getting out there early, talking about the fact that it was ransomware, giving consistent updates to its shippers, to the general public. We were very engaged with, obviously I mentioned government, but also with the media and helping them to understand what happened, what operational workarounds we were putting in place, how we were securing the pipeline while you know OT was down, um, and what we were doing to get it back up and running as as quickly as humanly possible. So um, ultimately, you know, I, I think it was a, a really interesting case study. Um, if you recall, the DOJ was able to claw back some of the ransom payment, um, working with chain analysis and some other, you know, uh, entities in tracing that money back to dark side. So just a really, a really, I don't want to say cool one to be involved in, but certainly one that was memorable for me. What's the most extreme tactic you've seen one of the gangs use? Oh, very timely question. So we have a case right now, and, and Brett, you know, we're we're quite used to seeing the typical pressure tactics from these gangs in terms of extortion, meaning they're calling employees, they're they're heckling customers of the victimized company, um, you know, really trying to publicize the event with the press, those types of things. But 
I had one a couple of weeks ago where the threat actor group actually sent a bouquet of flowers and a condolences card to the seat, the house of the CEO of the company. Um, so that was a new one for me. And I would have to say probably one of the most extremes. Another case we worked on was for a bank that was being acquired by a larger bank and the um the the bank that was the seller uh did not want to pay the ransom so the threat actor group reached out to the CISO of the buyer bank trying to get them to pay the ransom they were very attuned to what was going on in the M&A process and clearly were keeping up with the the financial happenings of the company so that was another one that was quite quite out there as well yeah what's the most common communications mistake that companies make that one thing that they often do that they really shouldn't Ooh, great question i i have to say you know i understand the reluctance to come out of the gates guns blazing in terms of saying that an incident was ransomware but I feel like, you know, so often, as I've said before, we see companies prolong the news cycle by saying it was a, an outage and then moving to security incident, then moving to cyber attack, then ultimately ripping the Band-Aid off and saying it was ransomware. It's like, it happens to everyone these days. It happens to Fortune 50 companies. It happens to small hospitals. Like, just say it and go out there and help your customers by sharing IOCs, telling them what happened. Um, everyone's worried about, by saying ransomware, you immediately have to start answering data impact questions and the time clock starts ticking when it comes to regulatory notices, but you're gonna have to go there anyway. So just be honest about what happened. Um, that's a big frustration for, for me, just from the, the comms perspective. Um, I, I would say that's one, the other one I, I touched on briefly, um, we've seen a number of companies, and I, I know you guys have seen it too, say immediately out of the gates that no data was impacted, no evidence of data impact, no evidence of data exfiltration. But again, you're not, you don't really have a ton of evidence to work with because the threat actors are smart, they cover their tracks, they wipe the logs, they destroy backups. Um, so it's really hard to you know, defend that, I think, when when you're making statements based on your evidence at hand. Uh, so we see customers have to, or clients have to walk that back often, and that always pains me. Um, the other thing I, I think I see often is this, when you're a B2B customer or B2B client, um, sorry, B2B entity that is servicing uh, end customers, there's a there's like a reluctance to get on the phone and talk to them, which I get because you know the main I think guiding principle in crisis comms is you want everyone singing from the same hymnal. You want everyone to be consistent, using the same talking points, talking about the incident in the same way. But also, you've got customers that have real questions about the risk to their own networks, meaning is the malware self-propagating? Am I at risk of infection? Is it okay for me to do business with you or to main, maintain this point of connectivity between our systems? Um, and without those assurances and someone on the phone picking it, you know, picking up the phone and saying like, hey, look, here's what I know. I'm willing to get our, our CISO or InfoSec team on the phone with yours. We can share IOCs with you. We can tell you where we are in the investigation whatever you need, we're here. Um, you know, it's just that mentality where it's like stonewall customers until we have a final forensic report. Like, why? Why? That's not that's not good communications or business practices by any means. So I'm a big proponent of you know, we're, we're here to help companies communicate, not say nothing. Whenever I see uh, a press release says uh, says there's no evidence, there's no evidence that customer data has been been lost. I always wonder, is there evidence that it hasn't been lost? <laughs> you know, how hard how hard have you looked? Um, so, when thinking about companies calling in specialized crisis communication help, um, you know, 
I think of companies I've worked for, companies of, you know, 20 people or 50 people, 100 people, how small, you know, a company should consider that and, and, and when, just for any size company, when should they consider using someone external rather than in-house PR resources? Before an incident happens, ideally. <laughs> no, but I mean, truly, uh, uh, the companies I think that fare the best in incident response scenarios are the ones that we've been working with on preparedness plans, that we've, we've gone through roles, responsibilities, tabletops, workshops, and they've built that muscle memory on not only how to um, put pen to paper on uh, responses that they're going to need during a crisis scenario, but they've done that and involved their external advisors, meaning we know who the incident response team is from a forensic standpoint. We know their legal counsel. We've all gotten in a room together. We've shaken hands. We're not meeting on the day that, you know, encryption happens. Those companies really do tend to do that. Um, for those that are bringing it, us in, kind of in, in all the live wire situation, I mean, the sooner the better, because the first thing that we're going to do is help to craft a narrative around what we know to be fact right at that point in time, then we're gonna start scenario planning. What do we do if data hits a, a shame site? What do we do if the threat actor starts heckling your employees, your customers? And the, the sooner we can get involved and start prepping comms for each one of those crazy scenarios, the better off that a company is gonna be because they've got that playbook ready to go and ready to, de to deploy um, no matter what happens next. So. Ideally, you don't want to be reacting to those things in real time. You kind of want some time to, to breathe, to put those things down on paper, to make sure everyone's aligned and knows what they're going to do should the, the worst happen, the next kind of worst thing to happen and in the incident happens. Um, and in terms of size, I mean, like I said before, you know, we help companies that are, I, I work, I've worked with Fortune 5 companies, and those guys have, you know, really built out communications teams, um, and they, they, may have, they might have 50 resources on deck in-house to draft things, to circulate them through approval processes, but likely they're really, really, really good at um, handling crises in their industry. Meaning if you're a, a huge airline, you're probably awesome and really ready at, and really ready to respond to um, a horrific plane crash or a passenger getting dragged off a plane. But cyber crises aren't something that they see every single day. So I think the benefit that we bring is, this is all we do, right? I've got 50 people on my team where the most junior person on the team has done a hundred of these. So we can really help them to look around corners and just sort of anticipate threat actor activity um, or the, like I said, the next worst thing to happen that they need to be prepared for. So I think having that senior level counsel just as an extension of the team is useful. Um, and then for smaller organizations that just don't have the resources or the bandwidth to be building out crisis communications playbooks in the middle of, you know, also trying to answer phones or whatever else it may be that they're they're multitasking and, and doing, um, where we can do that as well, which is nice. So I'd say again, the sooner the better. <laughs> I, th I think. Uh, sorry, Brett. Just one thing I I, I wanted to touch on. It's uh, based on what you said, Meredith. I think, I think it's really important in in our industry that we you know try to stop the sh shaming that people or companies feel if they do have an attack, if they, if they are the victims, because as you said, it happens to massive Fortune 100 companies, it happens to small companies, it happens all over the place. And, you know, MCSoft, Brett and I are with a software company that provides endpoint protection. If anyone tells you that their software is completely going to protect you against everything, they're lying. Um, uh, Brett and I were actually joking earlier this week, we saw a company that has a guarantee guarantee you won't get hacked and then in the small print we'll, we'll give you back your license fee <laughs> well thanks very much that's very helpful um no I silver who that is. Cyber, right yeah sorry for interrupting brett no problem do you ever meet resistance from in-house pr or are they normally quite happy to be able to 
end off these situations? I think, you know, just having been an in-house PR person at one point in my career that um, I, I don't want to say felt threatened when outside consultants came in, but was like, you know, this is my space. I can handle this. This is my company. Nobody knows this company better than me. I think there's a there's just a different perspective that outside consultants who do nothing but this day in, day out can bring to the table. And I quickly realized that when I needed help, I was going, you know, at Equifax, I was going through this massive cyber incident for the first time in my career. I had certainly never been through, you know, the domino effect crises that came with that, meaning CEO, you know, transition, insider trading allegations for four executives, um, government investigation. So having you know, folks on the team that were an extension of the team to help and had seen those things. Um, were, it, it was almost like a, a safety blanket and, and a comfort, you know, a comfort thing for me. And I, I realized they were there to support me, to help me, to make me look good. And that's kind of the approach that we take when we do get a little bit of pushback. And, and it happens from time to time um, with the corporate communications folks. It's like, look, we're, we're, we're here to, to help you, to make you look good, to make your jobs easier, and really, you know, just to help you see around corners. Because, again, we this we got 20 matters going on right now, and I guarantee you what you're going through is probably happening to about 12 of my other clients right now. What about very small businesses that really don't have a PR team? How should they respond? How can they respond to an incident? Um, you know, I, I don't know that it's that different from very large companies. I think that, you know, no matter what size your business is, you face some level of cyber risk. And having a plan down on paper, even if it's just roles, responsibilities, and what the key actions that you are going to take in the first 72 hours of an incident, having that down on paper will put you in such a better place than trying to invent that, but, you know, as I said before, the moment that en encryption happens, right? Um, so so I, I, I mean, that's kind of like, for me, a, a blueprint for success is putting that plan down on paper and knowing in advance even if you don't have them, you know, in your regular tabletops or simulations because you can't afford it, but knowing who you would call from an insurance standpoint, from a counsel standpoint, crisis comms, forensics, ransom negotiators, like just, just know who you're going to call and take the time to meet them in advance so that you have some of a relationship rapport with those guys when the worst case scenario happens. To move away from communications for a moment, what's your take on the question of banning ransom payments, or at least severely restricting the circumstances in which they can be paid? So not speaking on behalf of my employer, this is Meredith Grafonti's opinion. Um, I, I just don't see how banning ransom payments is feasible. I mean, we work with companies all the time who, and I'll, I'll give you an example, who have policies in place that they under no circumstances will negotiate with terrorists, pay, pay you know, ransoms, that type of thing. And then, you know, depending on their organization, the operational downtime is so significant that they're taking a huge financial hit, much greater than the, the ransom payment or the data that was stolen from them is so sensitive and so reputationally harming that they reconsider really quickly. And I've seen boards flip, you know, flip on a dime basically when they, when these types of incidents face them. Um, and I think you know when you're when you're talking about situations like a colonial pipeline, like hospitals that are impacted, where the nation is facing a gasoline shortage, or you know hospitals are having to divert emergency services or they can't, you know, treat cancer patients, that makes you reconsider, you know, what's the lesser of two evils really quickly. Um, we worked for, for a hospital recently that 
had a ransom attack, ransom payment, uh, ransomware attack, and was adamant about not paying the ransom, and then uh, discovered that video footage from the hospital had been stolen, and it was some pretty pretty awful video footage. And the their board reconsidered paying the ransom very quickly, um, and settled that case ultimately. So, I just I just don't think it's I don't think it's plausible. What about restricting though? Should anyone be able to pay a ransom in any circumstances? I mean, I certainly believe in, you know, obviously the the checks and balances that exist with OFAC, with sanctions. Um, I'm a huge proponent of collaborating with law enforcement, CISA. We actually have on, on staff on my team, the first um, head of public affairs and communications from CISA under Chris Krebs. She's been a tremendous add uh, to the team, but I think, you know, the more intel we can share with law enforcement, um, with government, that public-private sector partnership, you know, myth that everyone talks about. I mean, look, we are seeing these groups get disrupted. I think the government is doing everything they can to, you know, go after these guys to the, to the extent possible. And, and that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing for all of us. Awesome. And with that, I would like to thank you, Meredith, for joining us. Your uh, experience and insights have been very interesting, very interesting to me. I'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in. Stay up to date on the latest in cybersecurity by making sure that you subscribe to our podcast. Meredith, thanks again. Luke, Brett, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.